Well, I hope I won't forget to press the record. Let's move on straight to our deceased. I'm wondering how the new tripod is going to work. This should be fine. November 21st, 1991. Time, 8.43 p.m. Recording for medical students from the University of Missouri. The autopsy is conducted by Jack Hammond. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always worth having a look at the files before conducting the autopsy. That is where we can find all- Well, who do we have here today? Mention the rookie mistakes, uh... Oh yeah, that's right. That's my Orin to sensify you for a few. Found on the outskirts of a parking lot near a gas station, the deceased is locally known as Old Toby. Homeless and unemployed for at least a couple years, he had gotten into fights and had been bullied by the problematic youth of the town. He was that type of a man who never kept up alcohol, which caused him to be homeless. As a young man working in a suburban coal mine most of his life, he already- The body was found at 7 o'clock by Sheriff Matthew Thompson, White male, 76 kilograms, 5 foot 8, age unknown. The deceased is a local homeless man named Toby Chambers. His son runs a hardware store. His wife ran away years ago. Local police have talked to residents, so we know more about the deceased. For example, that he loved drinking, and by no means was abstinent. Such clues can direct us to things that are worth keeping in mind during the autopsy. Found on the outskirts of a parking lot near a gas station, where he often found on the outskirts of the deceased, the body would mention found on the outskirts of the deceased, the body white male, 76 kilograms, 5 foot 8, age up. Oh, where are the damn gloves? No music today. I don't want it to jam me. We'll get to making notes on the board. I don't know how it could have worked without this gadget before. Now we can get to work. We're going to need the camera. It should be here somewhere. Must have left it in one of the drawers. Let's follow the procedure and prepare photo documentation. We must follow the top down. Before we start searching for traces on the deceased's body, we need to take a basic photo that goes in the files. Before we start searching for traces on the deceased's body, we need to take a basic photo that goes in the files. Voila! Now we move on to the next step. Trace search. We're going to need better we're going to need better zoom here. And that's perfect. People affected by homelessness most often die from accidents, alcohol abuse, or they freeze to death. Unfortunately, both suicide and homicide are also quite common. <clears throat> well, you don't have to stand close to be able to smell a strong odor of alcohol and other discharges. 
There's nothing left to say. Old Toby didn't sp- While taking the photos, some entries that could be potentially lethal caught my attention. Let's take a closer look using the magnifying glass. By the look of his feet, I assume Toby must have worn uncomfortable and dinky shoes for quite a while. However, such wounds have nothing to do with his death. There are frostbite marks all over the deceased's body although they are most visible on the tips of his fingers. They can be recognized by the very specific color of the skin. However, the hands tell us much more. An old wound that hadn't healed properly. It must have been some kind of burn or other injury. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with the potential cause of death. Hmm, that's something interesting. While making photographic documentation, Ecchymosis can be seen on the deceased man's head. The appearance indicates the intravital nature of the wound. We'll come back later to see if everything is alright with the brain. What do we have here? Yeah, the odor can be the result of alcohol intoxication. The condition of the head tells us it could have been a fatal accident. It could be freezing to death. An old wound that hadn't healed properly. It must have been some kind of burn or other injury. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with the potential cause of death. By the look of his feet, I assume Toby must have worn uncomfortable and dinky shoes for quite a while. However, such wounds have nothing to do with his death. At this point, that's all I can do based on all traces on the body of the deceased. The inside should tell me much more. Let's move back to the body. Now let's check the level of muscle tension. This will allow us to establish time of death. Let's raise the deceased's hand. And then let go. The stronger the rigor mortis gets, the greater the resistance from the muscles will be. As you can see, the hand falls loose. The rigor mortis has already subsided. We can then assume that the time of death stated in the files is correct. Let's grab a scalpel. You can boldly cut with the scalpel. It won't hurt him no more. We always start with the neck. Next, we separate the skin and prepare to remove the ribs. The adipose tissue has an intense yellow hue. As you probably already guessed, we're going to need the scissors. After removing both cartilage and bone tissues, we are actually interested in two things that you can see at the very first glance. The lack of organ congestion means that, although the deceased was cold, hypothermia wasn't the cause of death. We can eliminate freezing as the cause of death. Hmm, 
That's interesting. Frostbite in New Orleans. Actually, the weather this fall has been surprisingly nasty. I don't need this tool now. The deceased smoked like a chimney. Let's take a closer look. We see widespread black and tarry deposits caused by smoking cigarettes. Despite the tragic condition of the lungs, they are not the cause of death. Now we need to go grab the syringe. At this point, we need to test the level of blood alcohol concentration of the deceased. We move on to collecting blood from the heart. Five milliliters from the left ventricle should do it. Now, we prick the bladder and draw about 10 milliliters of fluid. We also collect the fluid from the deceased to determine the level of alcohol concentration in the vitreous humor. Keep in mind that you have to set the right time and speed on both knobs before we the centrifuge. Our samples may break into pieces due to the centrifugal force if we set up the wrong coordinates. I myself am terrible with numbers because I suffer from dyscalculia which is why I always keep the appropriate coordinates at hand. Ugh, damn it. If something goes to shit, it's on the way. That's probably the blown fuses again. Held up. I must have had a flashlight somewhere. Ugh, and I was hoping to clock out early today. What? What was that? Where did it go? Definitely the fuses. Right goes first, left next. Voila! Ugh, where's that unbearable noise coming from? That's strange. I'm pretty sure I closed the window. The homeless probably misses me already. All right, let's see what we... Where were we? Oh yeah, the blood alcohol concentration. Well... Everything is telling us that the BAC, blood alcohol concentration, is high, hence the smell we're getting from the deceased. Still, to be 100% sure, I have to send the samples to the lab. Unfortunately, I don't have the equipment to conduct a detailed analysis here. Now let's take a closer look at the stomach. Uh, 
As expected, the stomach has no major external damage. In this case, further inspection is no use. We must cut him open. interesting. In addition to a large amount of gas and liquid, the stomach also contains small amounts of yellow grayish food content resembling some kind of meat. Either our deceased hadn't eaten in days, or some of the bulk of his stomach had found a way out. Now oh, it couldn't have been suffocation, could it? Now we need to focus on the cardiovascular system, especially the heart. We take the organ and look it up and down, carefully. At first glance, the heart looks fine. The pulmonary trunk and aorta seem to be in good condition. There are no pathological changes that have contributed to our Toby's death. Well, once we've got the body ticked off, let's take the autopsy saw to cut through the skull to cleave it in two. Remember, the skull, not the saw. Anyway, we will start dissecting the brain from the occipital lobe. In this way, the brain's dura mater is slowly revealing itself. After the basic examination, we can see that the cerebral gyri in both brain hemispheres are symmetric and the bumps between them are clear. So far so good. The hemat- Holding a knife with a long narrow blade in your dominant hand, cut the cranial nerves on both sides, pulling the brain towards you. Remember, just one small fragment examined under the magnifying glass is enough to dispel or confirm our doubts. We then take the fragment of the brain to the tray and, literally and figuratively, go over it with a fine tooth comb. Just as I initially suspected, we can rule the fatal accident out as well.
Same as we did with the stomach. While cutting a small organ, such as the trachea, we must perform a precise incision to be able to cut with ladies. And based on the report and preliminary documentation, it is safe to assume that the deceased passed out after consumption of alcohol and then fell asleep on his back. Then the gastric contents refluxed and flooded the airways, causing death. That's why we don't forget about the recovery position at dorm parties. And now it's all clear. The death was caused by suffocation. I don't know how it could have worked without this gadget before. We now come to the deceased's neck. In addition to a large amount of gas and liquid, the stomach also contains small amounts of yellow grayish food content resembling some kind of meat. Either our deceased hadn't eaten in days, or some of the bulk of his stomach had found a way out. Hmm, that's interesting. Frostbite in New Orleans. Actually, the weather this fall has been surprisingly nasty. It went quite smoothly today. I'm about to get off. In order to bring the chest of our deceased back to its initial state, at least to a small extent, we must sew the deceased using the baseball stitch technique. This stitching method is very strong and quick to do. I should probably get to that. I'm coming, I'm coming. Ugh. This is Dr. Jack Handman. Please leave a message. Good evening. How are you? How are you? How are you? What the f is that supposed to be? I'll finish the stitching and I'm getting the fuck out of here. What the fuck?